morning, everyone. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And welcome to Wrightsville United Methodist Church. It is Palm Sunday, and we are delighted to be able to bring worship to you in your home this weekend. A special good morning to our friends at Oleander United Methodist Church who are joining us today. We mourn with you in the loss of your pastor, Mandy Ian, this past week. May God grant you grace that in pain you may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. If you need anything, please do not hesitate to contact us here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church or contact your former pastor, Tara Lane, at Trinity United Methodist Church. Again, we at Wrightsville extend our condolences to you and will continue to keep you in our prayers. This is Palm Sunday. It marks the beginning of what Christians call Holy Week, where we remember the last days of Jesus Christ before his death and resurrection. And we're going to remember the acts that take place in this last week in special ways, in ways that you can participate in from home during this time of social distancing. So first, we're going to have our annual Stations of the Cross. This time, it'll be videoed and it'll be sent to you so that you can do the Stations of the Cross from your home. Also, on Maundy Thursday, we'll be sending you a liturgy that you can do, again, from your home. A way for you not to have communion, of course, but we're going to have a love feast with your family or if you'd like to dial up a friend and do it um, with a, a friend, that would be uh, fine as well. We encourage you to do so. Um, thirdly, we're going to be recording on Easter sunrise service. Um, usually, of course, we're down at the beach with about 1,500 of our closest uh, friends, but uh, this year with the beach being closed, we're going to have to do something a little different, but uh, we will be providing you an Easter sunrise service that we're going to record and send out to you that you can watch at sunrise on Easter Sunday, or you can watch it later in the day if you'd like to sleep in. Fourthly, we're going to be sending you a message from Bishop Hope Morgan Ward that she is sending to all United Methodists in the North Carolina Conference on Easter Sunday. And last but not least, we certainly want to invite you to take a minute and remember the church through your tithes and offerings. You can mail your check-in to Wrightsville United Methodist Church, Post Office Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, 28480. Again, that's Post Office Box 748. Or you can go to rightsfulumc.org and you will see a giving icon on the home page. And it's very simple to be able to give your gifts back to the church um, during this time of social distancing. If you're a member at Oleander, we invite you to give to your church as well during this time. Will you pray with me? God, our hope, today we remember that when Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem, the people shouted Hosanna and proclaimed him as their king. Help us to honor him every day, to choose him as our leader, and to follow him in the ways that lead to new life. For he reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, both now and forever. Amen. Today you'll find we're practicing very strict social distancing, so our um, children's sermon is going to come from the home of Pastor Hope Vickers. Our music will be coming from the home of the Jewell family, and our prayers will be coming from the front porch of Pastor Christina Turner. I invite you to continue to worship the Lord your God. The King of Glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. Who is this King of Glory? What shall we call him? He is Emmanuel, the promised of ages. The King of Glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. In all of Galilee, in city or village, he goes among his people curing their illness. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. He gave his life for us, the pledge of salvation. He took upon himself the sin of the nation. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. 
Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. Good morning, boys and girls. I am so glad that we can be together today. I'm talking to you from my home in Oak Island, and I get to share worship with you today. So I invite you to come closer. Let's get up close to the screen so that we can talk together for our children's time. Uh, today is Palm Sunday, and it's the start of the week we call Holy Week. That's all of the week before um, Easter, and we hear all the stories about Jesus and what happened. But today, on Palm Sunday, I want to invite you to do something. Since we can't be at church and have palms to do our processional or parade, I want to invite you to hear the story about Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey that's going to be told for our sermon. And then I have a project you can do at home. And so the story is that Jesus was put on a donkey, all the people gathered around, and they, they came together and picked branches, not just palms, but all kinds of branches to wave. And uh, Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem. Uh, they put their, their uh, jackets, their coats, their robes on the ground for him to walk over, sort of like we have a red carpet for uh, celebrities. Uh, sometimes you see those kinds of things on TV. But what I wanted to tell you about was we can have a parade and celebrate Palm Sunday even at home. You can get a branch or um, palms if you have them, but I brought one to show you. Here's mine, okay? And what, what we want to do is to invite you and your family, brothers and sisters, or whoever lives at home with you, to get a, a, some sort of a branch and make a line like a parade and go outside and march around your house. Um, and remember that Jesus is the one that leads us. You see, all the children around Jesus at that time loved him so much because he blessed all of the children. He loved children. And he had all those children were having branches and they were waving them like this and they were singing, praise the Lord and hallelujah, hosanna, praise our Lord. Here comes our Savior, and they followed him into Jerusalem. Isn't that wonderful? Just such a wonderful thing to think of. So get your, get your uh, palm like this, or uh, branch, whatever kind you have, and today, sometime, go out in your yard with the rest of your family and have a parade around your house and celebrate that Jesus loved all of us, especially, especially, the children. Let us have a prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love. Even in these days when we're not together, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that Jesus loved all the children. We ask your blessing on them just as he blessed those children when he was on earth. We ask you to love and protect and bless these children today. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Christmas has its cradle where a baby cried. Did the lantern shadow show him crucified? Did he foresee darkly his life's willing loss? Christmas has its cradle and Easter has its cross. Christmas has its cradle, shepherds came to see, little son of Mary, Lamb of God to be. Had his father warned him, none would grant him room, save in Christmas cradle and in Easter's tomb.
Christmas has its cradle Wise men came to bring Fur and gold and incense Offerings for a king Fur alone stayed with him Death's bomb for this boy From the Christmas cradle To his Easter joy Christmas has its cradle Where that baby cried In the Easter garden Christ lay crucified When death's power was conquered God's life through him poured Christmas has its cradle And Easter has its Lord Good morning, Wrightsville. If we haven't met, my name is Christina Turner and I am Associate Pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And it's my joy today to invite us into a time of prayer. There are so many things to lift up in our lives and in the world right now. Even amidst our regular joys and sorrows, there's now the COVID-19 pandemic. We especially wanna lift up the family, friends, and church family of Reverend Mandy Ion, who passed away this past week. Pastor Mandy was the pastor at Oleander United Methodist Church, just right down Oleander from our church. And so for all of our friends from Oleander United Methodist who are joining us for worship this morning, we are so sorry for your loss. We are lifting you up in our prayers. And please reach out to us to let us know how we can support you. We also leave a time of silence in our prayers every week to allow us to name a person or situation that is close to our hearts to lift them up to God. And so we'll be doing that today. As we pray, I invite you to lift up the name of anyone who you would like to lift to God. As always, if you'd like someone to be put on our prayer list, we invite you to call the church office at 256-4471 or to email Mickey Perry at M-I-K-K-I at rightsillyumc.org. And so now I invite you to bow your heads and to pray with me. Lord Jesus, this is a different Palm Sunday than one most of us have ever experienced. We miss the sounds of the children shouting Hosanna. We miss waving palms, receiving our palm crosses, and celebrating your journey into Jerusalem. But Lord, remind us that even though this feels like a strange and unexpected Holy Week and Easter, that you specialize in bringing life out of hopeless situations. Remind us as we walk this week with Jesus from the palm parade to the cross, to the empty tomb, that you are a God who is always bringing light out of darkness, who is always bringing hope out of hopelessness, who is always inviting us when it seems like the world and our lives and everything around us says no, that you always say yes. God, we ask that you would bring new life, that you would breathe new life, that you would save us from all of the things that, that threaten us right now. As the crowds of people shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, we also pray, save us, Lord. We bless the name of your son, Jesus, our healer, our friend, the Messiah we did not expect, but that we needed. God, we lift up to you today, all of those who grieve, all of us, those who are lonely, all of those who are sick and suffering, especially those suffering from this coronavirus. We lift up to you, the doctors and the nurses, the respiratory therapists and the aides, all of our public workers and essential workers. We lift up those who grieve and cannot be with the ones that they have lost. We lift up to you, the young and the old and all of us in between. 
And Lord, we also lift up to you all those who are near to our hearts and whom we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. O oh God, who is with us, whether or not we are shouting hosannas, whether or not we are waving the branches of palms in a church, or whether we are in our PJs in our home. Lord, we thank you that your glory does not depend on our circumstances, that your grace is beyond our imagining, that your power, your creativity, and your imagination is beyond everything we can fathom. We thank you, Lord. We shout, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And we pray in his name, the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we usually have a time of offering in which we offer our gifts to God. Even though we're not able to meet in person, we are working as a staff and as church leaders to be good stewards of our finances, to find ways to trim our budget. And we would encourage you, if you are able, to maybe pause the video at this time and to give online at rightsillumc.org or through our app. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way and write a check to P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, 28480. We also invite you um, to reach out in service in a couple of different ways this week. One is that April is the beginning of our Vision 2020 practice of service outside Wrightsville United Methodist Church. This month, we're going to be a little bit creative in inviting you to serve. And we are going to be sending out a list of oppor service opportunities as we go through this month. We're also going to be hosting an online virtual Super Saturday service day on April 18th. And so stay tuned for more details about that. But we also encourage you to read in your Vision 2020 book and continue to think about maybe how you can be in service to your neighbors, even from your house. We also would love to lift up our charity from this week um, that we are um, highlighting with our outreach committees looking beyond emphasis. We are lifting up the work of A Safe Place. A Safe Place is an organization here in Wilmington that works to help women who are escaping from trafficking. They may have um, found themselves in uh, situations that most of us can't comprehend. And A Safe Place works to empower them to uh, find new skills, to reach healing, and to create new lives. We are already working our United Methodist Women's Board and Circles we're able um, to work with um, Family Promise, uh, to work with some folks who are experiencing homelessness, to provide many dinners. And our outreach committee was able to reach out and to provide um, birthday gifts for um, a set of one-year-old twins um, with a safe place. But we encourage you, if you would like to give, to go to the same place that you can give on the website, rightsillumc.org. And you can click down and on your memo type outreach slash family promise. You can also designate that as a memo line as part of your check that you send in. And now I encourage you to give generously in this season as we offer ourselves and our gifts to God. After visiting our staff members' homes throughout this service, we're back at our church home at Wrightsley United Methodist Church. And so we're going to have our scripture reading come from the Gospel according to Matthew, the traditional text that's read on Palm Sunday. You'll find it in chapter 21. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. 
This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me? Almighty and everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever longed for the past? Of course, we all have at some point or another. It's something we know. It's a place where we feel comfortable. We have fond memories of the past. The future, though, now that's, that's less certain. We can't say for certain whether that'll be good or whether it'll be bad. So that makes people anxious from time to time, not knowing what's coming. But today I'd like to invite you to dream about a better future. What would it take for us to get on board with God's vision for our world? I want us to think about that. But as we get started, let's start in the past. Let our thoughts go back to two ancient cities, way back to Genesis. Cities that will forever be synonymous with wickedness, Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember the story of Lot. He's hurrying to Zor with his wife and his two daughters in order to escape the rain of burning sulfur by which God would destroy these two wretched cities. By the time the little family reaches Zor, Sodom and Gomorrah are burning infernos. By the mercy of God, they escape a horrible, terrible death. And Genesis says, And God overthrew those cities, and all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. And then follows this never-to-be-forgotten epilogue. But Lot's wife, behind him, looked back she became a pillar of salt. Wow. She turned back. She didn't wish to leave. Her memories were there. Her possessions were there. Her sons-in-law were there. It's been suggested by some that the kind of life she loved was there, in which case her security would have been there. And for whatever reason, she turned her eyes back, away from the forward path. For me, the big question was law school or divinity school. When I dropped out of law school, I didn't immediately drop out. I officially took a leave of absence so I could come back if I wanted to. I knew I was receiving a renewed call to ministry, but I was nervous. I didn't know what lay ahead. I knew what law school was like. I didn't know what divinity school would be like. And on a practical note, how would I pay for all of this? Am I just going to take on this debt from my year of law school and have nothing to show for it? Yep. And then take on more debt by going to Duke? Well, that answer actually turned out to be no. Because God made a way through giving me scholarships and a student pastor appointment to help me pay the bills. Looking back, I believe I made the right decision. And ever since I started pastoring that little church outside of Roxborough, North Carolina, and started taking classes at Duke, I really haven't looked back. It's easy for me to see that now. But it wasn't so easy when I was 23. I'll admit that for the two years after I left law school, before I entered divinity school, it was downright hard. I made the right decision, but it didn't come with the same resolve that Jesus showed in his journey to Jerusalem. I was simply studying for a career. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he knew he was headed to the cross. How many times our Lord could have turned back? How many times the security of home and family and the quiet life of the carpenter shop must have played upon his mind? 
following the temptation experience. When it became clear to him what direction the forward path would take, he could have turned back. And so maybe he would have, except now he was on his way. He could have turned back when, he became, when the way became difficult, when there was little to eat and the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. He could have turned back when the Pharisees hounded his every step. They cross-examined his every gesture. They stirred up public opinion against him and even sought on numerous occasions to kill him. He could have turned back after announcing to his disciples that one of his own would betray him. He could have turned back at Jericho, at Bethpage, at Bethany, when he knew full well he was walking into a steel trap at Jerusalem. Somewhere, deep down within that tranquil part of himself, which the noise of the world could not penetrate. I suspect that as he rode into Jerusalem proudly straight back on the back of a borrowed farm animal, he must have addressed himself in an attitude of victory, thinking, I did not turn back. No man, he said, having put his hand to the plow and then looks backward, is fit for the kingdom. The forward path lies ahead, and one must be on their way. Who of us has not been inspired at some time by personal experience of the Spirit, a feeling of the movement of God upon our lives, Christ filling us with a new enthusiasm for life and the business of the kingdom? We've had those mountaintop experiences where we've rededicated our lives to God's will. But then, then, the coals burned down. Our vision grew dim. The enthusiasm waned and the forward path no longer rose up to meet us. We looked back to where we've already been, where we can see, where there looms an easier way than the challenges that lie ahead, the one that we can't see. Starry-eyed, we set out on our way, but for whatever reason, we turned back. Was it because we didn't have the time? Leslie Weatherhead was once called on to see an old man over 80 years of age who was dying. The old fellow was frightened to the point of tears, so as Weatherhead spoke to him just as tenderly as he possibly could about God and religion, the old man interrupted him with these words. He said, Preacher, I've led a very busy life. I've never had time for that sort of thing. Weatherhead thought to himself, You've had over 4,000 Sundays. Fortunately, he didn't say that out loud, but the truth is, we do have the time. Do we turn back because we don't have answers to difficult questions? Martin Niemöller was a German pastor who was confined to a concentration camp for eight long years. Shortly before Christmas one year, one of his daughters attempted to visit him, but was denied permission. Not long after, she became ill with diphtheria and died. Nemo was informed by a rather abrupt guard who said, Ah, one of your children has died. The pastor asked, Would you have the grace to tell me which one? The guard didn't know, but he did allow Nemo to call his wife. Following the conversation, Mrs. Nemo returned to her room to find that their son had placed a photograph of his dead sister on the desk. And beneath it, he copied a verse from the book of Job. It said, Hitherto shalt thou come, and no further. If we have turned back in the presence of difficult questions, many of which will never be answered on this side of eternity, then we've learned nothing from the Christ who dared to ride into Jerusalem on that long ago Sunday and turned not back. This morning, I'd like to contrast the triumphal entry into Jerusalem with a story from the Gospel of Luke, because I think it tells us how not to understand Palm Sunday. I'm in Luke chapter 9, starting at verse 51, if you want to turn to that in your Bible. And it says, When the days drew near for him to be received up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. To set his face toward Jerusalem meant something very different for Jesus than it did the rest of the disciples. You can see the visions of greatness that danced in their heads back in verse 46, where it says an argument arose among them as to which one of them was the greatest. 
Jerusalem and glory are just around the corner. Oh, what it would mean when Jesus took that throne. But Jesus, of course, had another vision in his head. One wonders how he carried it all alone for so long. Here's what Jerusalem meant for Jesus. He says, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem meant one thing for Jesus, certain death. Nor was he under any illusions of a quick and heroic death either. He predicted in Luke 18, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and everything that's written of the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. They will scourge him, and they will kill him. You see, when Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, he set his face to die. Now remember, when you think of Jesus' resolution to die, that he had a nature just like ours. He shrunk back from pain just like we do. He wasn't immune to it. He would have loved to have enjoyed marriage and children and grandchildren and long life and esteem in the community. He still had a mother and brothers and sisters. He had special places that he liked to visit up in the mountains. To turn his back on all this and set his face toward vicious whipping and beating and spitting and mocking and crucifixion was not easy. It was hard. It was really, really hard. Can you imagine what he felt? I can't. I don't know of any other way for us to begin to know how much he loved us. Except, as he says, greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. If we were to look at Jesus' death merely as a result of a betrayer's deceit and the Sanhedrin's envy, Pilate's spinelessness, and the soldiers' nails and spears, it might seem all very involuntary. And the benefit of salvation that comes to us from this death might be a, a way of saying, well, God's just providing a silver lining. You know, making a virtue out of a necessity. But once you read Luke 9, all those thoughts have to vanish. Jesus is not accidentally entangled in a web of injustice. The saving benefits of his death for sinners is not an afterthought. God planned it all out of infinite love for this world, and he appointed a time in which to do it. Jesus, who's the very embodiment of God's love, saw that the time had come, and so he set his face to fulfill his mission, to die in Jerusalem for our sake. No one takes my life from me, he said. I lay it down of my own accord. So Jesus sets out for Jerusalem. And it says in the text that he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. I'm getting back in Luke 9. But the people would not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. It doesn't really matter whether the rejection is just because Jesus and his companions are Jews and Jews and Samaritans don't get along. Or whether the rejection is a more personal rejection of Jesus as the Messiah on his way to reign in Jerusalem. What matters for the story is simply that Jesus is already being rejected. And then the focus shifts to the disciples' response, specifically the response of James and John. Now this is important. Stay with me here, okay? James and John ask Jesus, after he's rejected by the Samaritans, Lord, do you want us to bid fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Jesus, of course, had already named these brothers sons of thunder. Here we get a glimpse as to why. But to be fair, I don't know that I wouldn't have said the same thing that John did. You know, Jesus, we're on our way to victory. Nothing can stop us now, so let the fire fall. Let the judgment begin. Oh, how Jerusalem will tremble when they hear we're coming. Jesus turns, the text says, and rebukes them. Then they went on to another village. Now, what does any of this mean? Well, I think it means, first of all, 
that a mistaken view of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem can lead to a mistaken view of discipleship. If Jesus had come to execute judgment and take up an earthly rule, then it would make sense for the sons of thunder to begin that judgment through a fiery battle scene. But if Jesus had not come to judge, but rather to save, then a radically different form of discipleship is in order. Here's a question put to every believer by this text. Does discipleship mean deploying God's missiles against the enemy in righteous indignation? Or does discipleship mean following Jesus on the Calvary road which leads to suffering and sacrifice? The answer of the entire New Testament is this. The surprise about Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah whom we call Christ, is that he came to live a life of sacrificial service, even unto death, before he comes again to reign in glory. And the surprise about discipleship is that it demands a life of sacrificial service before we can reign with Christ in glory. What James and John had to learn, what we all have to learn, is that Jesus' journey to Jerusalem is our journey. If he has set his face to go there and die, then we must set our face to go with him. Now one might be tempted to reason just the opposite. You know, well, since Jesus suffered so much and died in our place, therefore we're free to go straight to the head of the class and skip all the exams. I've heard that a lot throughout my life. Um, He suffered so we could have comfort. He bore abuse so we could be esteemed. He gave up the treasures of heaven so we could lay up treasures on earth. He brought brought the kingdom and paid for our entrance, and now we live in it with all its earthly privileges. This is not plain biblical reasoning. It goes against the teaching in this very chapter. Just before this scene, Jesus tells the disciples, If any would become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. When Jesus set his face to walk the Calvary road, he was not merely taking our place. He was setting our pattern. He's both substitute and pace setter. If we seek to secure our life through returning evil for evil or surrounding ourselves with luxuries in the face of human need, we will lose our life. We can save our life only if we follow Christ on the way to the Jesus died to save us from the power and punishment of sin, not from the suffering and sacrifice needed to love others. Notice verses 57 and 58. This is Jesus' way of correcting James and John's misconception about the glories of discipleship. He says, the, uh, Luke says, As they were going along the road, a man said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said back to the man, Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now why does Jesus tell a would-be disciple that he has no place to lay his head? The answer is simple, because he expects disciples to be like him, and he wants them to know this is costly. The road to Calvary is not the road to prosperity. Now, that doesn't mean disciples have to sleep standing up or that we can't earn lots of money for God's sake. But it does have something to say about who, what, and where we've invested our time, talent, and treasure. Right now, I mean right now, we're living in the weirdest time. I think we'd all agree. But life has not actually hit pause. We're still living in it. But it does feel like we're all waiting for life to return to normal. So when we get back to normal, when this time of social distancing comes to an end, where will we invest our lives? Will we look back and yearn for the old ways? Is that what we want most of all? Or will we look forward to something new? 
who would be willing to make a sacrifice so that others might have hope? Are we willing to get involved in the nitty-gritty with those who are seen as least lovely and most needy? Are we willing to forgive someone for the mistakes they've made? Are we willing to put our security in God rather than in things? Are we going to go back? Or are we going to go forward? Let us be grateful for the grace which God has shown us. And let us ponder how we can show our gratefulness back to God in brand new ways in this season and beyond. Let us not look back, but instead, let us help move the kingdom forward, day by day, by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, hear our prayers for the church and for the world. Grant that all who confess your name may be united in your truth. To live together in your love and reveal your glory to the world. Guide the people of this land, of our churches, of all nations, in the ways of justice and peace. That we may honor one another and serve the common good. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.